Uh, good, evening. good evening, everybody. My name is Ruth Erisman with Susan Glassman. I'm a co-president of Women's Voices Race for Social Justice, and we're very happy to welcome you to this evening's presentation. I think many of us have been considering various aspects of racism in our society, uh, but perhaps not so much environmental racism. So we're very pleased to have two very knowledgeable speakers this evening explore that topic for us. Before we begin, I, I do want to invite you um, we, to participate in our racial justice um, video club on September 22nd. There'll be a virtual discussion with author Helen McGee um, discussing her book, The Sum of Us. And on September 28th, we're having a lunch and, lunch and learn and hosting Susan Koenig, who is the executive director of St. Louis County Housing Authority. Um, you can access those registration for those on our website, Women's Voices Raised. Um, and we hope that you'll be able to participate in those as well. And of course, we always want to encourage our listeners to join us as members. We have some really exciting work um, going on in the areas of violence prevention, in affordable housing, in criminal legal reform, and, and some work on voting rights. So we welcome you to become a member and to join us in that work. Before we begin uh, our presentation, I wanna thank Carol Wolfsey who arranged this presentation and she will introduce our speakers. We do ask that everyone uh, would mute yourself before we begin so, um, so we, your picture doesn't inadvertently appear on the screen. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Carol now. Thank you, Ruth. Ruth and welcome everyone. Um, good evening. Um, as Ruth said, this evening we're going to explore the deeply rooted problems of environmental racism with Maisha Johnson and Jeanette Mott Oxford, who are members of the Metropolitan Congregations United Environmental Justice Team. MCU is a community organization that brings together religious congregations community groups and individuals to work to change public policy for the common good and create a better life for all. Um, Jeanette, Jeanette Mott Oxford, affectionately known as JMO, perhaps does not need an introduction in a group like this. Uh, she has been an advocate, educator, writer, and organizer on issues of poverty, health, housing, racism, human rights, equality, and campaign finance reform in Illinois, Kansas, and Missouri since 1983. Um, she's been an executive director of two statewide anti-poverty not-for-profits, and she was state representative in Jefferson City for a portion of St. Louis City from 2005 to 2012, and lots more. But I want to move on to our second speaker, who is Maisha Johnson. Maisha is the co-founder, director of Community First Plus, which was created this last December. Community First Plus is the intersection of environmental justice and housing justice. Maisha is a St. Louis community organizer and leader involved in tenants' rights and environmental impacts on low-income communities. After years of seeing black and brown communities passed over for resources, Maisha decided to make a change in her community. Serving first as a volunteer and then stepping into her role as a tenants rights organizer with the Dutchtown South Community Corporation, Maisha started organizing the DSCC community empowerment meetings in 2017. This effort led to the development of housing security training and advocacy with Homes for All, as well as the development of the State Street Tenant Resistance, which Maisha co-founded. 
During this time, Maisha held a host of Know Your Rights training sessions for St. Louis tenants. In 2020, during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm sorry to say we're in our second year, Maisha took part in the development of the St. Louis Housing Defense, Defense Co Collective, which includes Homes for All, Action St. Louis, Art City Defenders, the Sierra Club, and the St. Francis Community Services. The collective works together to help tenants with their immediate needs. Maisha participates with the eviction data team, the utility moratoria roundtable, and the housing and court roundtable. She has worked with city officials on a tenant's bill of rights and has participated in Black Lives Matter rallies and marches. Whether it's connecting tenants to resources, helping to stop an illegal lockout or eviction, calling the landlord when a tenant is being harassed, showing up at city hall, the courthouses, the sheriff's office, or even the landlord's front door, Maisha is a change agent demanding social housing and environmental justice. Welcome to both JMO and Maisha. Thank you. While JMO is getting um, our slides together our for our presentation, um, one, I want to thank you, Carol, for your introduction. And um, yeah, the work is important. And it's so many spaces that the work can be done in to help sustain a family, a community. Um, environmental racism shows up in many different ways. And so the justice that we fight for also need to show up in those spaces. So the change can be made with community and the ones that's organizing around it. I wanna thank you all for allowing us in this space to have this conversation with you and uh, learn more about how environmental racism shows up in these communities and how we together can fight, fight the good fight <laughs> for our people to become more sustainable and have a voice in, in the matter of issues that they're facing. So we'll start with um, speaking of um, a pioneer of the postmodern environmental justice movement, Dr. Ben Chavez coined the um, term environmental racism. One story states that Chavez cried out, this is environmental racism at a movement of his arrest during the 1982 PCB landfill protest in North Carolina. The environmental racism is racial discrimination in environmental policy making the enforcement of regulation and laws, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste facilities, the official sanitationing of the life-threatening presence of poison and pollutants in our communities, and the history of excluding people of color from leadership of the ecology movement. I mean, um, so a lot of this, you know, a lot of folks don't talk about these things in certain spaces and it is very important on in understanding how these things, these different topics that they're talking about show up in communities. A lot of folks that I've spoken with have often spoke of, um, you know, the housing that 
they experience and you know the kids my 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 child isn't learning what they need to learn but i have a neighbor that you know their child goes in to school in this community and they seem to be more advanced we haven't um really bring a lot of attention around the different ways that um environmental racism shows up in communities until recently. And I've noticed that, you know, a lot of groups have um, starting, started to become more concerned about um, how racism shows up in their community, whether it's around housing, education, utilities, it, it affects those who are, who could, be leaders in the community. It, it halts the um, creativity that these leaders have to bring attention and awareness around the issues that they, they um, experience. As for the flooding in these communities, it usually overcomes um, their, their control, like, if the sewage, the sewage system is clogged around these communities, then it often leads into the home, which caused flooding in the home. Um, the lead that, that we often speak of is found in a home. And so, so the home is where a lot of these things are connected, you know? Um, the lack of green spaces. You see the connection on the screen, um, you know, close proximity of landfills, the toxic waste that leads into the ground, you know, that the children play on, the plants and factories that's aligned along the um, communities, like 55 and 70. If you drive down those highways, you often see a huge um, portion of those communities are factories. And, you know, the polluted water that comes along with that, where, where are these chemicals being drained to? And this is what our children are drinking. The, the, the lead often is found in water. That's why a lot of the black and brown children have, have high lead um, count when their blood is being tested because of all these things that surround their home and intervenes in the play, the play space that they have, whether if it's the backyard, the front yard, the playground, in these communities, these are the experiences that they face, you know, lack of green spaces. If you were to come out and see concrete and factories all the time and vacancy, how do you, how would that make you feel as a person? You know, if we were to see more flowers, if the children were to see more gardening, you know, uh, more green spaces in the area, I believe that it, it could change some of the mind frame and thinking that they have. I've um, spoke in several spaces over the last couple of weeks of the different um, areas where I see trees are cut down. So, you know, they're taken away from the green and JMO will speak more into how um, environmental justice affects those living in these areas. Thanks, Maisha. Um, Dr. Robert Bullard is another of the pioneers of the environmental uh, justice movement uh, and, and somebody that points out environmental racism very specifically. He says that environmental justice embraces the principle that all people and communities have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. And to achieve environmental justice, all people, regardless of ethnicity, color, or national origin must have equal protection from environmental and health hazards. That has not happened. For example, code enforcement has happened in white communities in St. Louis, but not in black communities. Uh, and then, uh, equal access to decision-making and policy-making process 
allowing them to have a say in the health of the environment in which they live, learn, and work. Uh, and certainly there are many things to be concerned about uh, just now, voter suppression. You know, how, how does that impact on the ability of people of color to have a say in policymaking uh, when it may be harder for them to, to vote uh, by some of these new laws that are being passed? This is a really important report, and I'm going to put the link while uh, Maisha is actually part of this report. So she's going to talk about it, but I'm going to put in the chat box how you all can find this and read it. It's uh, online from Washington University. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to go back one. Go ahead and start talking about it, okay. Maisha. I've got the, the link there for people to find it online. Um, and I'm going to uh, get back to my slides and get the, the, um, the way that they are set up changed here so that I can get back to the slide that I meant to be on. There we go. Thank you, J-Mo. Mm -hmm. So as J-Mo spoke of, um, there was a report um, that came out from WashU, the Environmental Racism Report in St. Louis. We started talking about um, the different environmental justice and racism issues that we seen popping up in communities. At the time it was um, sustainable housing, uh, high rates in the utility bills, food deserts, um, illegal dumping and vacancy. The portion of my story was the high utility bills. I compared my bill with a partner that was working with us at, in this group that um, developed this report. And we um, seen that there was a big, a huge difference where their bill was 117 and mine's was set almost $700. I reached out to um, Amarin to see if they could send someone to contact, you know, come, if I can put, be connected to someone to come and look at the meter. They told me my landlord had to because it was his property. My landlord is a foreigner who doesn't speak very well English and nine times out of 10 will not call Amarin due to the fact that he doesn't like to have conversations where he feels he's not understood or he won't have the conversation if he doesn't understand why it's needed. It was very needed because this was hindering my family from getting to the next level with me having to pay 700 to $1,000 in an electric bill, which was like six times more than what the comparison to what my friend had. And so we start looking more into it. And I, we seen that I was being charged like two or three extra taxes than she was. And we, so she works with Sierra Club, Leah Clyburn, and they start pushing, you know, Amarin to lower their rates, to understand that there's a difference in the communities and got some, um, got some um, clarity on what needed to be changed and why it needed to be changed and made them <laughs> agree to make those changes. It didn't, um, it didn't seem right that folks in communities that's already struggling, having to pay um, like a $700 light bill, how can a family become sustainable if the light bill continues to be that high? And after having that conversation with Amarin, it was still hard to push. They had to keep having that conversation, keep having that conversation. And this year, I will say, thank you, Leah Clyburn, Sierra Club, for giving that push. My bill now, I haven't seen it exceed over 270, even with us running the air conditioning, even with, you know, having to, um, 
add fans in certain rooms to keep it cool that has that has no air conditioning in it. But also understand that had I not spoken about the experience that I was having with Amarin and compared my bill to Leah's, we ha would not ne had never come up with the idea that they were overcharging the lower income communities than what they were charging those in the upper class communities. So here, um, JMO and I, we, we were in conversation and we was like, it's so many ways that all of this is connected to one another. I keep accidentally advancing the slides. I'm gonna go back here to where I wanna be. <laughs> <laughs> And what you will see in the slide that JMO is um, gonna bring up is how a lot of these um, disparities connect and they it begins within a home, whether um, it's EJ issue, whether it's, you know, um, the, the food apartheid, it, they're, they're, most of these communities where you see high um, Amarin bills often are food deserts, often have experience of polluted air, whether if it's in the home or around the home, there's high vacancy. You know, um, you will find a lot of children in that community that suffer from asthma or have tested positive for lead. Some of these other, um, the home energy cost is high in those communities. So how do we expect for folks to be able to pay rent and stay current with rent when their electric bill exceeds the cost of rent? And then where is it left for, you know, them to purchase food and the necessities that is needed for those families? I will let Jamo go more into um, some of the other connections that is on the slide that you see here before you. <laughs> this uh, slide reminds me of my days in seminary when our systematic theology professor said, uh, every damn thing is connected to every other damn thing. And so that's <laughs> kind of what this chart shows, I think here is, is um, um, multiple things here, you know, uh, play off of each other. Um, if, if a child lives in a home where there's mold, they're more apt to, to, to have asthma. Uh, if they aren't able to eat healthy food, it makes the asthma worse. Uh, that report from Washington University shows that, uh, uh, you know, whereas one out of four children in St. Louis has asthma, black children are more, uh, 10 times more likely than white children with asthma, uh, children with asthma. Uh, the, the black kids with asthma are 10 times more likely to have emergency room visits. Uh, and, you know, quite possibly that's because those black children are also uh, in, in areas uh, that are more impacted by air pollution because of what Maisha was talking about. A lot of those smokestacks from industrial kind of sites that are near where they live, uh, the, the poor air quality that we have because of coal fired uh, fuel plants, um, um, they're, you know, more apt to be exposed to uh, lead poisoning and mold in their homes illegal trash dumping, about 90%, I think the report says of, of the uh, illegal dumping happens in, in black majority communities as opposed to white. So um, when, when uh, city officials allow this to happen in, in black communities and, and not in white communities, uh, there's a difference in, in how public policy is being uh, uh, implemented. Um, the, some of you will recognize that phrase down there in the right-hand corner, team four report. Uh, this is a, a, sh a shameful uh, episode in, in uh, St. Louis history, the Team 4 report in, I think, 1974, uh, when there was strategic disinvestment in North St. Louis uh, impacting on Black communities. Uh, and uh, during the question answer period, I'll pull up a, a, a link to a, a story written about this by Jamala Rogers. It's somebody that many of you would know uh, about um, some hearings connected to the Team 4 report. Uh, so uh, the, a lot of the things just don't happen by accident. Uh, you know, many people would say, well, you know, we can't help it that black people live where those things are going on. Well, a lot of that happened. Uh, some of you have probably read Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law. 
uh, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. These things didn't just happen. There was structural oppression involved in it and how this stuff happened. Um, there's a lot that we can do about it. We don't want to just make you hopeless tonight. There, there are things that we can do about it at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, there, there's a, sort of a menu of some things that we might consider, and MCU is exploring some of these. Uh, we can check off one item right there, right? Expand Missouri's Medicaid program. We finally uh, won that uh, after uh, taking that to, uh, through petition initiative. Uh, and then having to take it to court when the legislature refused to implement the people's will, which was uh, just an utter shame. We've done some minor improvements and the we there is the, the broader social justice community around uh, landlord tenant law, uh, Empower Missouri and uh, uh, some, some fine attorneys uh, from Arch City Defenders and other, other places, uh, the EHOC from the Equal Housing Opportunity Council, uh, good folks working together managed to uh, to pass a, a law against illegal lockouts. Uh, a lot of landlords will like lock people out of their apartment without giving them eviction notice, uh, separating people from not only like the clothing that they need to go to work, but also from medicines uh, that, they, that they need for conditions like hypertension where they need, or diabetes where they need to take medicines every day. Uh, and it, it can be a, a real challenge when that kind of thing happens. Um, uh, all too often, it, this happens to, to black tenants. Uh, and um, so there are some things on here that, that uh, some things have been uh, done about. Uh, MCU is presently uh, in conversation with um, a member of the Board of Aldermen about uh, possibly offering some legislation about illegal dumping and some of the other uh, uh, issues that are, that are on this list, uh, improving uh, uh, building code uh, enforcement some things that would actually uh, address uh, many of the things on the previous slide uh, that we were talking about that, that impact this disparately on uh, the black community uh, in the St. Louis region. Here. We, yeah, go ahead, Amisha. Oh. Here we'll talk about um, some of the action items that the Missouri Department of Natural Resources have um, been in discussion about um, the increased numbers of the quality monitors in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. We would like to see that. Um, we would like to see increase in enforcement on polluters. Um, MCU has been in discussion with some congregations that um, to put implement monitors, air monitors on top of their building. We have 12 that we are ready to put in place to track what um, minerals and material, you know, particles that's floating around in the communities that we plan to place them. They will most likely be placed around um, a community that's considered a black and brown community to see what they can pick up from those communities. But also I wanna speak of the lawsuit that um, DSCC has um, brung against the Kendra Moore um, facility over here off of 55. Uh, we, in 2009, I started experiencing some illness and didn't know what it was about. Started going to the doctor later on, found out that I had stage two cancer. Um, after recovering from my cancer, we found out that my mother was, the, the reason she was losing weight and started to feel ill is because she has stage four cancer. Seven years prior, my dad had passed away. And when they did the autopsy, he had cancer. After speaking with many of the community members in Dutchtown, a lot of them suffer from cancer or asthma or some type of lung disease. We often find these illnesses in the communities that these factories surround. 
And as the SEC did, took it upon themselves to file a lawsuit against these factories, we can too in many other spaces. If we learn about what's going on in these communities and start having conversation on the power that, on what, on the issue and hold our power to change what's going on in these communities and show up for the folks that has been suffering in these communities, that's where we can make a huge change, not just in St. Louis, but in Missouri. And not just in Missouri, but throughout the nation. And that's Dutchtown South you're talking about, right? Dutchtown yes, South. Yes, Dutchtown <laughs> South Community yeah. Corporation. Yeah. Um, go ahead. When when uh, when we've hung out with you know groups for a while, we sometimes call them by their their initials, Acronym. and everybody knows what those yeah. all are all the time. <laughs> yeah. So Dutchtown South has been working on um, that for a while. Now we'll talk about some of the action items. Um, St. Louis, the in the city of St. Louis, we want to see. Um, an update in the building codes. We won't increase code enforcement for the buildings in the factories around these communities. We want to see the use of federal stimulus dollars to eliminate the food deserts and increase green spaces in these communities. If I walk out and see flowers and trees instead of concrete and vacant buildings, I'm going to want to take care of my surroundings, my home, my land around my home. I'm going to want to go out and, you know, participate with neighbors, have conversation with neighbors, sit on my porch. We don't see that often in these communities. And we want to see them work with state, the state of Missouri to increase air quality monitors. They're needed. They're needed because a lot of the things that we breathe in aren't often spoken of in the spaces that they need to be. There are many spaces that um, folks breathe in bad air and this clipping will give you more of an example on what that looks like. And this is an experience from East St. Louis. So that lets you know how what goes on in East St. Louis will show up in St. Louis. What we breathe in St. Louis will show up in East St. Louis. And you'll get more of a full story listening to Miss Cozy's story and her experience. See if it'll let me get to it, Naisha. Okay. Miss Cozy was a speaker at an event, the environmental justice um, event rally that we had last month. And she came and presented her story, which was really touching and, and had a lot of folks thinking on what, how can I be a part of this? How can I, you know, be part of the change and start that conversation? So this is why it's important that, you know, that the folks tell their story because it gets people's gears going on. What can I do to help make that change? I think I can make it play. <laughs> My children cannot grow up like other children. There are days when they cannot even go outside of our home and play and shoot ball and jump rope and all of the things that young children should be allowed to do. I live one and a half miles from the Olea plant in the East St. Louis area. And how do you think a mother feels when her children can have the same experience that other children have in their community. It hurts me to my heart. And so I joined the fight because I know that my children should not be suffering from asthma. 
When our area is under attack, what do you do? What do we want? When do we want it? We've had a, a few guest stars here, a, a few ads that we didn't mean to have, but <laughs> that's what happens when you try to play a video, right? <laughs> Let me get back to my slides here, Aisha, and I'll be with you in a moment. Okay. So in this story, you heard Miss Cozy talk about the kids not able to go outside and play. And I don't know if you heard it, but they, she said that they often come in and say, grandma, it's too strong. We can't play outside today. That, that, that is like heart wrenching that the children can't even enjoy outside something that should be free and you know open to everyone but everyone can't do so due to the fact of the air that they're breathing and i'll let jmo unpack it a little bit more well it it's not letting me get to where i could put that on the broader uh, the bigger uh, picture but uh in, in any case let us say uh, that uh, if you want to know what you can do to stand in solidarity with MCU against environmental racism, uh, we, we uh, announce calls to action on our Facebook page. So there's a way to get to that uh, uh, at that link. And uh, you all will have these uh, slides available to you after this presentation. Uh, we also uh, have a newsletter that you can sign up uh, for on our uh, website. And if you let me or Maisha or our other environmental justice organizers uh, know that you'd like to get a special uh, set of bulletins that come on environmental justice issues. Um, our communications people are working on having some uh, targeted uh, emails that, that you know, break down our issues by the interest area that people have. And then a, a really important thing that you can do is if you are a member of a community of faith, we do organizing in the faith community, uh, a, a source of people who have the right values often, uh, but many times they don't know, know what to do to address the, the issues that are going on in their community. So we try to build an organized presence of, of people of faith uh, on social justice issues like environmental racism. So uh, perhaps you would want to introduce your pastor or the chair of an appropriate committee, the social justice committee, the anti-racism committee, um, uh, the environmental committee, a uh, gardening committee, whatever. You may have a committee at your church that would care about environmental justice uh, that we should meet. So uh, uh, at the end, you'll see our contact information. If you'll jot that down, uh, we'd be glad to know uh, who you'd like to introduce us to that might allow us to build the power that we need to win some of these changes that we've been talking about. Um, and you know what? Uh, there's a video here that I'm, I'm just going to put this link for people to watch it later because we're, I'd rather that we had plenty of time for questions and answers, Maisha. Uh, this, video, this video explains how all of this stuff is connected. I'm going to put it in the chat box uh, so that everybody can see it. It was created by uh, the For the Sake of All uh, project uh, at Washington University uh, through a grant from the Missouri Foundation for Health. And it, it helps... Uh, helps people get all the challenges that happen in life for a kid when, when all of this stuff converges on them, how hard it is to win the game of life. We don't all uh, start off on a level playing field and it's a, a beautiful uh, a piece of video work, but it takes about five minutes. And uh, I think we'd rather have some conversation you can watch this video on your own. I'll put it down in the chat box and here's how you reach the two of us, um, uh, our phone numbers and our email addresses. So I will stop sharing and put in the chat box how you can watch that video on your own. Uh, and I'm sure that some of you may have some questions for us. There were some questions in the chat box. We all bring a couple of those up. 
and then there might be others that come. I have a question. Okay. My name's Tiana, and I would like to know if the utility companies were held responsible at giving any money back to those residents that have been charged like you were charged, Maisha, or do you know? I haven't received anything. <laughs> so, no, not that I know of. And so um, I, I've been given city money from the regional response team that um, has been having this conversation on, you know, how do we keep folks in their home? Because folks are losing their housing vouchers that are on Section 8 and, and um Oh, subsidized housing. Right. Once their utilities are shut off. They, if they don't have them on in a certain amount of time, they lose their voucher, which display displaces those that family. Correct. So we're going to canvas over the next three months to all the folks that's on the eviction list to see how we can get resources to them. And but, are there attorneys involved in this process, or? We're working on um, bringing more attention around this and having conversations with attorneys. Yes. All right. At Thank the you. moment, no, that hasn't been done yet. But yes, that is in the plan to have more conversations and attorneys getting involved. Um, I know that um, Arch City Defenders and Legal Services. Oh, it kicked me out. You're here. We can hear you. Oh. I think she's frozen up just for a moment. Um, uh, sometimes people's uh, internet connection gets a little bit weak, so um, she'll probably be able to reconnect with us shortly. Another question I saw in the um, uh, the chat box had to do with what year that report was published by Washington University. That was 2019. So it's pretty uh, recent material. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's, you know, pretty damning related to things like 90% of the vacancies being in, in Black communities. Um, if some of you went to the, the, the John Lewis rally for, for voting rights, uh, where we met in North St. Louis, I was shocked at the way the communities there have changed since the last time I drove through there. Um, as many of you know, I lived for years, you know, most of the year in, in Jeff City, drove home to St. Louis on weekends. So I don't always know exactly what's going on in St. Louis. I, I used to go into North St. Louis on a regular basis when I worked at Reform Organization of Welfare in the 1990s. But the, the increase in vacant properties and dilapidated properties in, in North St. Louis since the last time that I'd done any exploring in the, on those streets uh, was just breathtaking uh, when I went to that John L. Lewis march. Mm, mm, mm. There's a question for Maisha about uh, tenants accessing, accessing rental assistance through the federal, you know, federal um, stimulus money that's to try to prevent evictions. How's that gone, Maisha? Oh, Oops, she's, looks like she's frozen again. I think she's just muted. No. Okay. I, Can you hear me now? There, yeah, we go. There we go. All right. <laughs> Sorry, you all. My computer decided to go wacky. Um, <laughs> so we're in conversation. Like, as I said, we're going to hit the pavement over the next three months to get this information out to folks. The city, the experience with the city rental assistance the applications are long, so we've been doing pop-up rental assistant clinics where there where organizations and some law clinics have come together to try to better serve these folks because the process is so long and some of the wording they don't understand. So that process has been very slow in getting the rental assistance to the individuals that it, is facing this crisis. I think George Stair has a question. George, unmute yourself. You're muted. 
You're still muted, George. We can't hear you. Nope, you're still muted. Okay, now I think, nope, nope, still muted. Okay, let's come back then to George. Uh, let me, there was another question about uh, uh, wanting more information on how the federal stimulus money is being used to eliminate food deserts. Could you tell us more about that and about uh, more about food deserts in general? I was going <laughs> to see if JMO wanted to answer that. So in a lot of the black and brown communities that we spoke of, you will often see corner stores instead of a grocery store. And in the grocery store, I mean, the choices are limited, you know, um, there's not much healthy foods in the corner stores. There's a lot of um, processed foods. Um, they need vegetables and fruits in those stores in those communities. And that's not much of what you will see in the stores that is available to these communities. Um, there is some money in um, the stimulus bill of, you know, having community gardens, um, teaching folks on how to um, provide their own vegetables and fruits in the communities. There's been a few, a fruit, a few groups that distribute vegetables and fruit to the communities that. Um, lacks fresh vegetables and fruit. Um, money that is going out to help um, with this issue, I don't know much of that other than helping some um, farmers and black, and black spaces to be able to grow and provide for those communities. Right. There's there's been some attempts in Jefferson City to address this, and the Washington U University report on in, uh, environmental racism that we pointed to earlier says that the rate of of, of black St. Louis residents that have uh, trouble accessing uh, food is about double that of white residents, so close to twelve percent versus six point something percent for white folks. Uh, and as, as Maisha says, if the only place that you can get food is like Quick Trip, what does that do, you know, to your diet? If just about everything you buy is high in sodium, high in fat, high in salt, uh, well, salt and sodium is the same thing, isn't it? Um, but um, um, you can see why, why the Black community would have higher rates of hypertension, diabetes, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, with a, a steady diet of those kind of foods. Uh, there have been some bills in, in, in Jefferson City to try to give tax credits to grocery stores that will open in, in parts of the city that have um, uh, food, that are a food desert where, where it's hard to access uh, uh, any, any kind of, you know, um, grocery store that, that has fresh fruits and vegetables and a, and a variety of, of healthy foods instead of, you know, packaged lunch meats, those, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but tax credit as a solution is kind of an overused tool. It sounds good. People are like, oh, we're doing something. We're giving a tax credit. Um, but um, um, generally, <laughs> when I see a bill that's about tax credits, it says to me, we're not willing to invest any of our real money. Yeah. Uh, somebody out there is going to be able to, to, to take advantage of this, uh, this tax credit as a solution, but we're not really willing to invest any of, of, the, of our, uh, our, our state uh, common pot uh, towards something. Uh, and to me, um, uh, that's, it's, that's a, a problem that it's in everybody's interest to solve because our state Medicaid costs go up if we don't have food available to people. Then their health costs will be high and we all pay for that. Shouldn't we see that people are healthy instead? Yes. Can I think George got on that. There we go. Yeah, I got, am I unmuted now? Yes, yeah. you are. Okay, good. Um, well, this isn't the question I was going to ask, but on the food topic, uh, I once was a cab driver and uh, I would, uh, people would take the bus to the grocery store, I assume, and then they would take the cab with their groceries back home, 
you know, maybe once a week. So, and, and I think uh, uh, more affluent people could be in a food desert, they jump in their car and drive to the grocery store. So part of that is a transportation problem. Yes, it is, that's right, yeah. And um, so, but that's what, you know, I found poor people did. They, they go yeah. to the grocery store once a week and then pay the, for the cab to bring their groceries home. Right. And uh, I was very aware of that and I'd carry their groceries, you know, up to the porch for them. Um, that, that's a really good point, George. And then one of the challenges too, is if you're getting all of your groceries by, you know, say you're doing it by bus and you have to take a transfer. So it's a long, long trip. Let's say you've got a small child that you're holding with one hand and you're trying to carry your groceries with the other hand. How much groceries can you bring on the bus? You know, when you're trying well, to also watch a child at the same time. So you can't take advantage they take, of some of that hard shopping. Exactly. Yeah. So that that's forces you to taxi. pay for an expensive taxi ride. Yeah. Right. Well, once a week. I don't know, but that's kind of what people did. And uh, but I, my question I had was uh, after hearing all of these problems and then thinking about some of the solutions possible to some of these problems. I think somebody needs to uh, calculate, figure out uh, uh, cost effectiveness of various mitigating actions that could be taken mm -hmm. so that yep. we have some way of prioritizing what, what should be done. Mm -hmm. Now, like, like mold, for instance, is often that would be maybe a roof needs to be replaced, which is, you know, several thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and maybe windows. And windows also affect energy costs. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you do the roof, you can insulate, but all that, you know, it's thousands of, and uh, you know, you run into the, uh, uh, if you just make the landlord do it, he may go out of business. So I don't know. So, anyway, I think some kind of cost effectiveness uh, calculations would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, I, I have been in con contact with Mayor Jones' administration uh, uh, with, with a, another community group that I do some volunteer work with that does selective rehab. Their, their theory is that we can produce a lot more affordable housing with selective rehab instead of gut rehab or, or new construction, because the gut rehab and new construction are much more expensive and moderate rehab or selective rehab where you find a building that's worn down but not worn out you can apply, say, thirty to fifty thousand dollars to that instead of a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars to that, and and create a decent, affordable, uh, safe uh, place for people to live. So we were wanting the city to create uh, policies that are more um, well. It's not more favorable to the selective rehab. The the way that the the affordable housing commission's current uh, timeline for grants is set up uh, does not work for selective rehab because selective rehab, you when you see a building that's available, you need to be able to buy it and get in and do it right now. You can't wait several months until it's time to apply for the grant and then several months for the grant to be awarded. And uh, you know, that it doesn't work that way. So they need a flexible pool of money for selective rehab, we think. Okay, that sounds good. There, there is one uh, question here from Maisha. Um, could you please share what the experience of tenants have been accessing COVID rent assistance? Do you have any idea of how we can get money to folks who need help? There, um, there's been funding released. As I said, the application process has been tedious for those that have, um, you know, try to do it on their own. So that's why we, we've been hosting um, the rental clinics to assist these um, individuals and families on the process. Um, there's been discussion um, with Mayor Jones that um, how the process has been and Mayor Jones is in the process of um, revitalizing the application process so that it can be more um, accessible for um, individuals to utilize it on their own. And the process 
shouldn't be as tedious because they need a lot of documentation and there's a lot of reading and you know most folks when they're in need they hurry up and try to scan scan through and you know they might miss something right. so um they're trying to shorten it shorten right. the process and also make it more um I simplified because <laughs> it, you know, it, it confuses a lot of folks and it causes a lot of frustration for the individuals that really need the services. Oh, thank you. I think Melissa Hatman has her hand up. Could you unmute Melissa, please? Thank you. Um, just thinking about mentioning priority issues. I mean, there are clearly a, a lot of opportunities um, that we can look at um, and talking about community gardens and some of the things we can do around, you know, food insecurity and, and urban desert for, for folks. So I have to ask the question, and I know one of the things about lead in the soil, that sounds like a pretty overwhelming thing to tackle, but it seems like it would be a very important piece of this if you're going to try to plant community gardens because obviously you know if it's in bad soil then you know it doesn't it doesn't help so can you tell me a little bit about any conversations we've had about people who can really make this kind of thing happen and, and how how do you identify it how do you do it there's a few organizations that's working around this i um i have a friend tasha phoenix that is huge on Urban Gardens, um, she has the organization Evolve. Um, also the Red Circle has been working around um, planting gardens in the spaces that they feel that are considered food deserts. So those are two organizations that I know have that have been working on it. Um, I think Mutual Aid has been tapping into it a little bit. But um, as for now, it's just, you know, folks coming together and, you know, trying to get some land or finding a vacant area and planting. Mm -hmm. Some people get funding for it and some people just do it because they know it's needed in that community. I guess my, my concern is how do we identify safe mm -hmm. properties where you can plant and know that there's not an unusual amount of lead in the soil that exacerbates what we already know is a problem. Yeah. In, in those communities, lead is more than likely to be everywhere. So it, it, that part, hey, we can use your expertise if you have some creativity around it. <laughs> I know that occasionally there's there's some federal funds from like brownfield uh, lawsuits um, that can be accessed to clean up some of those sites. There was a former gas station on a corner near my house that left a lot of pollution, and and that had to be cleaned up through you know some funds that were available uh, due to some litigation. Um, so uh, there are some great environmental uh, justice attorneys in the St. Louis area. Uh, that would be a, you know, a great place to start, like the folks at Great Rivers, uh, to explore whether, whether they may, there may be a pool of money that can be used to address a particular site. Uh, also, some of the urban gardening um, actually uses raised beds where they, they bring in, uh, you know, soil to use and do, you know, composting to create, you know, more healthy soil to go in, into sort of like super container gardening rather than using the, the soil that's there might be another option. Okay, thank you. Yep. At, at my house, uh, we do intensive gardening in the yard and we've never tested for lead, but maybe we should have. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what that costs. Uh, the other thing about lead, we've had lead pipes bringing water in for a hundred years. Uh -huh. And I, you know, back when I had lead pipes, I asked the water company, company water department about it and they said as long as we keep the ph of the water correct then it's not a problem because the coating stays intact and you don't have lead poisoning well i believed them and uh then i've never been tested for lead either but anyway uh, uh since then i rehabbed and it, you know they've been replaced but i i'm 
I think most of the lead poisoning comes from paint and, and the old windows, we raise and lower the windows, that scrubs it off. And, it, you know, the, the, I, I'm a little disturbed that talking about spending so much money replacing lead pipes. I just think the paint should come first. Okay, I, I think we have time for one more question for Jeanette and uh, Misha. Is there one more question? While we're waiting for that question, um, back in 2017, a lot of the school um, water fountains were blocked off because they found high lead levels in the water fountains in the schools. So um, it shows up in many different ways, in many different ways. And it, and, and it, it, and it affects folks in many different ways. Yeah, uh, when I was a member of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators, when I was in the Missouri House of Representatives, we looked at how the infrastructure for water systems uh, is aging all over the country. You know, many of them are 75 to 100 years old or older, and um, we're unwilling to invest in that, uh, you know, because it might cause us to have to raise taxes, and we will never raise taxes is kind of like, you know, the, 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 the common mantra of, of many elected officials. Uh, but, you know, think about what we're willing to pay. Uh, you know, this was brought up to the National Council, uh, National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. And think of what we're willing to pay for a fancy coffee drink, you know, when we go to a coffee shop versus what, what we expect around water. We think our water should be free, <coughs> practically free. Uh, and yet what's, what's more important than clean water? Isn't that something that we should invest in uh, through the common good? Uh, to me, that's a real priority for our public spending. Uh, I would far more uh, want to spend my tax dollars on clean water for all of us to share than, say, building a ballpark for a professional sports team if you have to decide where to spend your, your, your uh, tax dollars. All right. Uh, now there's, there is one more big question, I think. If we can make a little time for that, then we'll close. Um, Ellen Wentz asks, can you please talk about the radiation experiments done on the black communities in St. Louis years ago? Hmm. I don't think that I know about that. Maisha, do you know anything about that? I don't know much about it. I do know that one of the landfills, there was a big, um, a huge conversation around one of the landfills out um, in the county. I think it was North County that the radiation was coming up from the ground and making a lot of the residents um, ill. And there was um, research around it. I haven't heard much about what the findings were, but there, they are starting to notice the radiation coming up through the soil. But certainly uh, experimentation on, on black people medically, whether it's the Tuskegee experiment uh, or Henrietta Lacks having her, uh, you know, uh, genes stolen uh, causes a lot of distrust uh, among the black community about anything that's a medical intervention. Uh, and and uh, we need to tell the truth about our history. There's, you know, a big debate right now. I think you all have had a really good program on critical race theory not all that long ago, right? I, I believe I tuned in for that one. Uh, and uh, we need to tell the truth about what's been done if we're, we're going to uh, uh, earn the trust of people in the current time. And it matters around things like this pandemic. If, if the black community is afraid to take a COVID vaccination because they know what's been done to the black community by medical science in the past, uh, it stops people from accessing help that is needed. So uh, we do need to get uh, honest about uh, the, the sins of the past. All right. I think we are at our time, or a little bit over time. So I'll turn it back over to our leaders. I just wanted to thank Maisha and thank JMO very much. Um, there will be a written summary of the program and I know it will be up, a recording will be up on YouTube also. 
Um, I know there was a question about whether the comments in the chat will be up also. I assume they will be, um, but I can't 100% say for sure that that's going to happen. Um, I, I've actually read the report myself. I do commend it to every single one of you. It's written in bullet points and it's written for the layperson to read. Um, it's very informative. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you all very, very much.